Welcome to the Passive Income Podcast. I'm your host, Dividend Dave. Please be sure to join the Passive Income Posse by clicking that subscribe button below. You definitely want to be a part of the Posse. Uh, Super excited for today's episode. I believe we're up to episode 75 already. 75 in just uh, over seven months. So that's incredible. Uh, Another trip across the pond over to the United Kingdom. Uh, This is my fourth or no fifth or sixth guest from either the UK and Europe. So uh, you can find him on Twitter at Eamon BF. And he is also known as the Dividend Addict. So I'm going to throw it over to you to give yourself an introduction. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Dave, for letting me um, uh, welcome me on this podcast. Um, look forward to sort of discussing what we have to talk about, especially with um, sort of different strategies and obviously being in different countries as well. There'll be um, some sort of conversation we can have there. That would be great. But yeah, um, thanks a lot for having me on the podcast. And um, yeah, it's great to see um, your your previous shows, etc. And um, yeah, you know, the fact that we come from two different locations as well, let's... Um, Let's get chatting, basically. Yeah, nice. Um, great point that, you know, I, I've definitely learned a lot from, well, from everyone I've talked to in the 70-some guests that have been on yeah. on the Passive Income podcast. Uh, being in Canada, the majority of my guests are Canadian and American, but the mm-hmm. the four or five or six, um, uh, you know, from the UK and Europe, I've definitely learned a lot about because, you mm-hmm. know, here we're obviously quite... I don't want to say isolated or insulated, but we, we, you know, we're in our own little bubble over here in North America and and we don't think of a lot of uh, great companies from the UK and Europe. Yeah. Yeah. So I know this is something I think about as well, because obviously a lot of the, um, you know, the dividend family on Twitter that I would call it are probably, you know, 75%, maybe 80% of the people that I'm connected with are not from American or Canadian. So I see a lot about, American stocks and ETFs and all that kind of thing. But um, with actually the broker that I'm in, it's quite difficult. Or in my, what we call an ISA, which I'll explain later, which also other UK investors might have explained about, um, you can't actually buy American stocks, which is a bit annoying when you've got those dividend kings, et cetera, and aristocrats aristocrats of, you know, you'd love to be able to purchase, but it's not so easy. So it's quite interesting, actually have to do your own research on UK ones instead. Right. So, but there must be other accounts that you could purchase. uh... You could do. Yes. There's a, there's a very, there's a sort of a variety of brokers, but we have a thing called a stocks and shares ISA in the UK. So what that allows you to do is you can invest 20,000 pounds a year tax free into stocks and shares. Um, So obviously all the dividends, et cetera, from that, any capital gains that you made, if you were to sell anything, um, all of that is tax free. Obviously, I'm not per- I'm not a person that's looking to sell. I just keep reinvesting the dividends and let the snowball grow, basically. Right. Um, but that's um, a great place to start your dividend journey, basically, because twenty thousand pounds a year is quite a lot of money to be able to have a side to invest fully into that every year. Right. I, I haven't looked at the exchange rate recently, but for those of us in those that's of us in dollars. Yeah, twenty five thousand dollars. Twenty five thousand U.S. dollars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So closer to twenty eight thousand Canadian dollars. So, okay. Yeah, that yeah. is a significant chunk chunk of change yeah. that you're allowed to invest tax free. It it is. It's a a massive loophole that not a lot of people in the UK exploit enough. But you know, it's it is a great place to put your your income and let it work for you better than it is in a bank because. I don't know what the exchange rates are in top Canada and it's all the interest rates in Canada and America, but we're looking at two to three percent at best in the bank. But right. inflation in the UK is currently about ten percent. Um, oh, yeah. You know, so I want to be putting my stuff in assets that are going to increase and also pay me a dividend in that same period, rather than it be sat in my bank and the bank's earning you know ten or twelve percent on my money. Right. Yeah. And you're and losing out to inflation. We are exactly. starting to get inflation back under control here, but it, it still seems a, a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure what the word is, um, be, be, you know, because they they compare it to the previous year. But it's like, OK, well, you're at four and a half percent 
uh, yeah. inflation in April, but that's only compared to the seven or eight percent of inflation last April, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Year yeah. on year, it's up four and a half percent. I understand that, which is still significant, as you said. If it was up from, yeah. So it's it's quite scary times, really, for the people who their money's in the bank, but they don't realize how much is being eroded by inflation. They're completely oblivious to it. Right. But, um, you know, you think you're doing of, okay, but you're you're losing. Exactly. Part of what I like power. doing is, is is educating people. Okay, it it's it's a lot about mindset as well. People being in the mindset that they're open to not just having their money where it's safe in the bank, um, and you know having it in other assets that are. Um, you know, a bit different. That's the thing. It's ingrained in everyone that putting your money in the bank is where it needs to be. That's where it's safe, etc. But that's all part of the, um, you know, that's how everyone's brought up. That's what education is, etc. Right. Whether that's the right thing or not, that's not really what I believe in. But my, the part of my Twitter uh, account is just, you know, educate people, have conversations with other people and just sort of learn how we can all get better at what we're doing, basically. Yeah, no, great points. And yeah, so many people are, like you said, you know, taught whether by their parents or even school, it's like that mm. save, save for a rainy day mentality. Yeah, exactly. And, and you don't realize that, 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 you know, you're yeah. saving for a rainy day, but you're actually living in the middle of a snowstorm in, in Northern Canada. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, I do want to so talk yeah, about. I'm... So carry on. If you had another point there, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's obviously that kind of thing is very much a global thing, it's especially sort of in the, you know, the the developed world, you know, the um, sort of Europe and sort of North America, et cetera, where, you know, everyone, you know, a lot of people do have, you know, banks, et cetera, bank accounts, and they, they have some sort of savings. It is about save as much money as you can, and then you can buy your house, and every, every month your pay packet should just about cover your costs, you know. Um, and, you know, for a lot of people at the moment, it's not even that. Their, their expenses are more than their income. Um, but it's just about financial education. We have a thing in the UK where the, um, uh, a group of people have just got together, actually, and gone to the government um, about providing more financial education in, you know, in primary school, in schools. Um, because when you come out of school, you don't know anything about mortgages. I don't know what it's like, actually, over in um, sort of Canada and the US, but you Same. don't know anything about sort of how to manage your own finances. It's all about, um, you know, how a plant grows and all about science and make sure you don't algebra and that kind of thing. When actually that's, unless you're going to do a certain specific job, they're very, very niche, basically. I don't use a lot of algebra in my day-to-day -day life. No, exactly. <laughs> um, but things like financial education and managing your, uh, finances and that kind of thing that's you know crucial to living basically but it's sort of overlooked yeah no and it's very similar here in Canada and the US uh, mm -hmm. again you know 70 plus guests in the in the past few months here on the passive income podcast yeah and I, I'll tell you the people that have benefited the most were the, the the ones who had knowledgeable parents that were able to pass that generational yeah. knowledge on to mm -hmm. their to the kids yeah. right yeah. So that's that's the the key difference. And now, you know, obviously more and more people are becoming educated and aware because we have things like the internet and you can just Google things and you can yeah. look things up on investing yeah. media. You can go to YouTube and watch videos and yeah, you can learn a lot on your own. You do yeah. have to sift through the misinformation, but yeah. you know, the majority of us can do that, right? We we mm -hmm. we, ha we have those cognitive cognitive skills to yeah, sift it's, it's a lot easier now to be exposed to that kind of thing, isn't it? Um, right. You know, as you said, there's a lot of things there. You know, whether that be Twitter, so any form of social media, we've also got um, access to a lot more books and you know online material as well, like YouTube. Um, you know, it's just a lot more uh, people becoming a lot more aware of it, whether they understand it or not or believe it is a different thing. But yeah, you know, from, you know, 30 years ago that was very different. Okay, I wasn't actually around then, but I understand. I I'm in a sort of fortunate position where we are more getting more and more exposed to that kind of thing. And as long as if you understand what it is, you know, it, you realize how much it can make a change to your life going forward, basically. Yeah, I, I think so. 30 years ago, obviously, we had books in the library, and that was sort of mm. your, your best uh, way to learn. And obviously, you know, 
in a small rural high school that I went to, the business books were very limited. Yeah. Whereas today you, you can just go on Amazon and you can have a book delivered to your door within like yeah. you know or, 12, 20 hours, less than 24 hours later. You yeah, have or even a, I, I have a Kindle. So, you know, you just download it or in five minutes, you can start reading it basically. Right. Uh, and that's sort of where my journey into financial independent, trying to get financially independent and just sort of um, also it, in, uh, I guess, growing my financial education and becoming more financially intelligent was where that sort of started through reading. And then um, I had this Twitter handle for a, it was a, it was a, like a, a gambling uh, app that we had in the UK for football. And that actually went bust, but I was also doing some stock market investing on the side as well. And um, I realized that actually investing in the stock market was a lot more secure than this. It was called a, a football stock market, basically, but it was a bit more gambling. Yeah. Um, I was like, look, if I invest in these big blue chip companies, they're not going to go into zero. Um, and they also, they're paying me, you know, four times a year as well. Um, can't really complain about that. So that's where I sort of got into that. And then reading around, following more and more people on Twitter and that kind of thing, I was like, actually, people are, you know, making this their full-time income. Yeah. The earlier you start, the, sort of the better it is. So I was like, at the time I was 21, I'm now 24. I was like, I need to start doing this as soon as possible. So as soon as I came out of university in 2020 and got a job, I started drip feeding every month, you know, of my salary into, um, into my stocks and shares ISA. Or oh, I think in the UK, in the US, it might be, is it called a Roth IRA? I don't know. That might be like a pension plan. Don't yeah, I've had, I've had American guests talk about uh, the Roth and the Roth IRA. Um, yeah. In Canada, we have... I've heard that mentioned a lot. I think it's a very similar um, sort of um, product. Um, but I think in the UK, I think we get quite a bit more, which is very fortunate and something we need to exploit as a nation. But that's how my sort of journey grew, just sort of speaking to other people, that kind of thing. It's not something that any of my friends or family are into. It's just a case of, right... I've seen people do this on Twitter, et cetera. People are talking about this in a lot of books. I'm reading investing books. So the one by Benjamin Graham, the intelligent investor. Um, that's a book that I, one of the first books I read that got me into investing. I thought, right, this is something I need to do. And if I start now, then in, you know, 10, 20 years time, I'm going to be sort of, you know, in a position where I might be able to live off those dividends. So yeah, exactly. Well, and you will and, be, um, you know, another 20 yeah. years, will be 44 and, I, I love the your uh, you know Twitter name there, dividend addict. Yeah, because it I mean, is as soon as I picked that, I was like that that just works every time. And I'm always thinking about because I know when my next dividend's going to come in. I'm like, the bigger they get, the more addicted I'm getting to just reinvesting them and watching them grow more. So I had one come in on Friday, which is from a house builder in the UK, and um, I mean it's about sixty pounds, but it's one of the bigger ones so far this year, if not the biggest potentially. But that's probably going to buy me roughly off my head about another 50 shares. And I can just see that snowball growing. It's nice. just, it's so nice to see. Um, and I, yeah, I am fully addicted to it now. Like, I'll admit that. <laughs> like a drug almost. Yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's a good addiction to have though. It I'm is. like a drug it addiction is. that yeah. it drains your bank account. Exactly. This is the opposite. Yeah, yeah, it puts yeah. money into your account. Exactly. I have a direct debit out of my bank account every month, which I'm sure a lot of you guys do. The ones that are most um, sort of, I don't know how you say it in terms of discipline is probably the best way to put it. You know, you know that every month, whether you can afford, you know, you need to make sure that that's going out every month. Don't be, oh, I can only afford half this month. You need to find a way to make it happen that you can afford it every month because you'll never regret um you know making sure that every month you you sort of drip fed into your account but if you suddenly miss six months in you know 10 15 years down the line that's going to cost you a huge amount of money um and that's why it's, it's, it's vital just to continue you know remaining consistent and every month even um, even if you can increase it incrementally that's even better but just setting yourself a target and making sure you hit that every month is um the best way to start is what i've found yeah, definitely. Uh, one of the, the very first investing book I read was way back in around 1990, and it was called mm -hmm. The Wealthy Barber. Uh, okay. I sent it to David Schultz, and I hope to have him on here someday if I keep bugging him enough on Twitter. It's respectfully bugging him enough on Twitter that yeah. 
but basically in his book, um, you know, that's where I learned the philosophy of pay yourself first. Yeah. So just meaning every paycheck, take whatever it is, whether it's five, yeah. 10, 15 percent, 20 percent out of every paycheck and make sure you pay yourself first and then pay your bills after that. So yeah, very similar to what you're, um, you know, talking about or talking to you of just making yeah. sure every every month or every two mm-hmm. weeks, whenever that yeah. money is, is going there, because again, over time, it's going to build, right? Exactly. And that's like the snowball. It's so easy for people. And a lot of people my age are still going out, you know, spending it on drinks and, you know, going out on food when actually I, I've sort of spoken, to, spoken to a lot of people in this industry and they've sort of said, you know, unless you can, you know, you're getting that in dividends, you don't want to be going, unless all your dividends are covering your expenses, you don't want to be going out and having needless takeaways and spending 20, 30 pounds, those dollars in the pub, you know, every now and then. It's yeah. just, okay, you've got to enjoy yourself, but also watch that might you know you might spend 20 or 30 pounds but that might get you a couple of pounds or dollars in dividends every year every year anyway right. and that's how i visualize it if I, my portfolio roughly is about five percent dividend yield if i think i spent 100 pounds i'm like every year that's five pounds which i could have got in dividends let alone any growth or anything but that's yeah. five pounds where i could have been earning passive income each year and that's about any growth or anything like that um and that's i think that's the best mindset and how to visualize it for me because i know that i'm missing out on income and i'm gonna have to then work for that time to get that money back yeah similar (laughs) obviously you know going into the pub every now and then it's okay to do it but you don't want to be doing it like five nights a week and one of the things i find here that i don't want to call it a complete waste of money but similar idea you don't want to be doing four or five nights a week of, of uber eats and DoorDash and skip the mm-hmm. dishes like that's a lot of money going to yeah. to a delivery driver exactly. and hey i'll do respect to the delivery driver they're out there it's probably a side hustle for them and and, yeah. and good for them doing it but you know definitely watch where your money's going yeah exactly if you you know a lot of people say oh i can't afford even a hundred pound hundred dollars a month to put you invest if you suddenly look at how many times you're getting a takeaway etc I mean, now takeaways are quite expensive here in the UK. You're looking minimum 20 to five pounds for two people to have a takeaway minimum, yeah. you know? Um, you're doing that once a week, that's a hundred pounds a month. Suddenly you put a hundred pounds a month away, that soon adds up. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're doing that over 20 years, that's a significant amount of money that you could, um, you know. I would say similar, like for me, if I, myself just one person goes through a mcdonald's drive through it's a minimum of a 12 dollar order right so right. and again yeah. i try not to do that very often but hey we we all go to mcdonald's we exactly really yeah exactly but don't be doing it 10 times a month and all of a yeah. sudden that 12 dollars is oh, in that case 120 you know it's a good product so it's like apple etc that kind of thing if you if you own the product do you want to be investing in the product also yeah, if you go, oh, if everyone, if there's a big queue at McDonald's all the time. It's like McDonald's is a great company to own. They grow their dividend constantly. You're, you're always in there enjoying it as a customer, but you also want to be, you almost want your McDonald's and your Apple purchases to be funded by dividends. It would be that, you know, that's the dream really, isn't it? Yeah, do you know what I call that? You may have heard me say on Twitter. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I have. Turn that cash register around. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that saying. Yeah, yeah. so, and... Really, I, you know, I'm uh, very much in that, you know, talking about, okay, whatever company you pay your cell phone bill to invest in that company, whatever yeah. bank you pay yeah. your mortgage to invest in that bank, whatever mm-hmm. electricity provider you have pay to that. But yeah, still very similar. If you buy Apple iPhones and iPads, then yeah. And exactly. if you go to McDonald's and if you buy, uh, if you drink Coca-Cola, then those are the companies you should exactly. be thinking about investing yeah. in, right? Yeah. I think I think for a lot of people, it's one the fear of losing their money, which you know that wouldn't happen in the bank, or it's very very unlikely to happen in the bank anyway. Right. Um, and it, it's sort of for them, it's lack of education. One, they don't think the bank's easy. I know I don't have to do any work of that. Whereas actually, obviously, you have to do some research, etc. But I think that's the great thing about ETFs: the fact that you've got the broad area. You can just stick all your money in the S and P five hundred if you wanted to, and it's going to do a pretty good job we know that okay we all 
as investors, we try and think we can beat the S&P 500. But realistically, when we look at it, do we actually beat the S&P 500 if we just put all our money in there? It's hard to tell. Um, but for a lot of people who don't know what they're doing, that's the perfect place to put your money. It's not got a big dividend yield, but it does, it, you know, the growth rate is brilliant. Yeah, I would say ETFs are probably the absolute best place to start, right? You just get this yeah. nice basket of whether it's 15 yeah. or 50 different companies. Yeah. And the ETF, the money managers take care of that and they say, okay, number 15 is dropping off because we it's not performing and we're going to replace it with yeah. another one that is performing. And really they're doing 99.9% .9 of the work for you. You can literally mm -hmm. just set it and forget it. Not financial advice, but <laughs> um, yeah, e ETFs are, are a great mm -hmm. uh, place Definitely. to start. And yeah. I think the majority of people's opinions in, in the dividend Twitter community. Yeah, exactly. Is it? And it's a great way to keep it passive because you know you're not having to constantly um check up on making sure that exactly you know the company's still performing as you want it to etc because you know there's a broad range there you're going to have some companies that have underperformed but some companies that have outperformed so it that's what the fund manager's job is to do so you know you're paying you're giving them a slice of the um the profits you take a, you, you pay a little price when you purchase it but that's something when you look at you just want to make sure the expense ratio is really low so um you know you're you're your, your costs on purchase is very small also. Um, and they're doing the hard work for you. Yeah, exactly. And over time, that little bit that you're paying to them, it's a drop in the bucket compared to- Exactly. I mean, you, you could you could spend that money at a different broker, you know, by just by looking at the monthly fees. You know, it's, right. it's, it's minimal basically, but um, it's definitely a great way for people to get into, um, into investing. It's very, you know, it's, low risk because you're spreading your you know your money across multiple businesses and the fact you've got you know no work involved is um it's surely very attractive but i think it's just a case of having the money mindset to understand that the money in the bank isn't isn't the best place but and it also, it's it's about being patient as well when you're a dividend investor you know it it's not suddenly going to triple overnight or anything like that you know it's just a case of slowly growing but as I say, I reckon, well, you know, once you're getting that, you know, 20, 30 years, it starts to sort of really uh, exponential growth and the exponential growth starts to kick in. Yeah, and that's sure. sort of where you really see the um, the compounding the passive effect. income take off, basically. Yeah, exactly. Compound effect take place. Now, I do have a question for you about an individual stock. Yeah. I see it on Twitter all the time from primarily people in the UK and okay. and some on uh, in mainland Europe. I, I know yeah. UK is technically part of Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over here in North America, we kind of think, oh, the UK, they're kind of just stuck out in the middle of the North, or not the yeah, middle, but yeah, yeah. in the North Atlantic and <laughs> not really part of Europe. Yeah. But we know technically you are. Yeah, um, yeah, sorry, yeah. I, I'm getting a little off track there with geography, but yeah. Um, so the individual stock is legal in general. And ah. honestly, I have no idea what that is, but I see it all the time and it looks very quite intriguing. interesting. I was going to speak about. So legal in general is actually my biggest um, holding. So legal in general is about 10% of my holding. It will pay, I think I worked out, it will pay me about £320 this year in dividends. Nice. Um, I think the, the dividend yield at the moment is probably somewhere between 8 and 8.5%, and which is high. Um, yeah. I've owned legal in general now for probably looking at about 24 months and constantly topped up when it's dipped. So the average price over the last 18 to 24 months has been about £2.40 to £2.50. So $3 in American terms or maybe $3.50 in Canadian dollar terms. Um, so and, and it's currently about £2.20 to £2.30. So it's about 10% below what the, the average price has been at. Obviously, that's brought up the yield. Um, it went ex dividend last month, so it pays on the 2nd of June. Um, so, about three weeks away from now. And that payment, the yield on that payment alone, I think is about 5 to 6%. But it's uh, a great company. It's an insure, a large insurance firm, but they also have their own, um, they're an asset management company also. Okay. Pensions, et cetera, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
it's a it's not a a growth company it's a large it's a blue chip basically but it's very well established it's grown its dividend over the last several years um i'd say probably over 10 years don't quote me on that but for the uk that's quite impressive we don't have as many dividend aristocrats as you get in sort of you you um sort of yeah north america basically right um, you sort of look at a company that has performed well during the 2008 crash if they were still growing their dividend through then and also during covid in 2020 they're fairly you know for us that's what we call a, div- an, a dividend aristocrat because if they can raise their dividend during the the most severe financial times we know that that's, that's a good one to be investing in um if you're looking at dividend growth so yeah, they've grown their dividend, as I said, for more than 10 years now, legal in general. Um, it's very popular with UK investors because it's got such a, a good dividend yield, but it keeps growing at it. I'd say, I think the, the compound annual growth rate of dividend is probably about 5 to 6%. So it's not huge, but at 8%, that's still a nice growth. Um, and the company keeps performing very well. It's got a huge um, sort of cash pile on the side, and it's got very low debt. And um, I think that's why a lot of companies, oh, sorry, a lot of individuals in the UK do invest in legal in general. Um, the only thing you do notice is that the company sort of revenue growth and that kind of thing is sort of 10% a year. It's never going to be 50%. It's one of those ones. It's just a slow grower, basically. But I think they said the fair value of the, the, the stock is about £3.50. So it's about 30% undervalued. Um, but obviously, we're the stock market is a little bit all over the place at the moment. So you are going to get some, you know, deals out there. And I think the PE ratio is about six or seven. So it's you know trading at a good price. Okay. So in a nutshell, Legal in general is an insurance company. Yeah. Uh, and they and then they have other assets that they manage as well. Yes. Yeah. And they are based in I would assume their headquarters are in London. Yeah, they're based in England. Yeah. With headquarters, probably London. Yeah, I think so. London, London, Liverpool, most- Manchester. We'll just name a bunch of UK cities. It's got to be one of them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So a lot of the a lot of the large companies in the UK will have their headquarters in London. Some of them maybe Manchester, but yeah. London is by far the biggest and most um, attractive city for Financial. large companies like those. Basically, right? Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you very much for explaining legal in general to not just me, but so many of us here in North America. That, like I said, we see it on our Twitter feed, and yeah. we have no idea what it is. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's it's definitely something that we as UK investors get excited about. It's definitely one of those that everyone in the UK um, talks about. And talks about, and you know, I think if they don't have it in their portfolio, considers you know putting it into their portfolio just because of the the, the dividend yield. One thing that is a little bit annoying, it would be a perfect stock if it paid four times a year. It only pays twice a year, which is a bit of a shame, but yeah. the dividend yield is so good. It's sort of, um, it's hard to um, overlook that basically. Right. Okay. So you said uh, that that legal in general was the biggest in your portfolio. Yes. Uh, what what company would be would be next like numbers two three and four yeah so i think the second one is uh bp which is british petroleum so um might you might know that's quite obviously a large oil company oh yeah based in the uk um i actually trimmed that position recently because that was my largest holding um however it made me quite a nice profit from the sort of Ukraine war and the oil prices shooting up to sort of, you know, around the hundred dollar mark, but now they're back down to about the $70 mark. And I think that will sort of stabilize that area. Those companies are still making a great profit, but nowhere near as much as they would be at the hundred dollar oil price. So um, I decided to trim that position. The thing is with the oil and gas stocks in the UK, so I own Shell as well their dividend isn't um, as reliable as someone like Legal and General or other companies. Um, you know, if they suddenly make a loss one year, they could just, in 2020, they just huge axe, uh, axe their dividend, I think it was about two thirds. So to then bring that back, you've got to obviously, it was that triple your dividend to get back to the, the stage it was. Right. Um, so I'm looking to, to take 
take the profits, move them into you know a variety of different um, stocks and ETFs to um, companies that are just solely focused on growing growing dividends, basically, because that's where I want to put my money, basically. So BP is number two. I actually have an ETF as the third one, which is called, it goes by INRG, but it's a global clean energy fund. So it's the 500, I think it's the 500 biggest clean energy businesses on the stock market across UK and US, mainly US. I think also you've got some in um, sort of Asia as well. Um, so a company like Enphase Energy, I don't know if you've heard of those. I think they're quite a large company in the US. Um, but there's sort of a lot of, um, not startups, but sort of well-established clean energy companies. So you've got like, you know, companies investing in solar, uh, wind panels and battery technology, all that kind of thing, basically. Um, so that's my third biggest holding. That's global, uh, iShares Global Clean Energy Fund. Um, and I think that's probably sitting about eight to nine percent of my um, portfolio. That's just one that I've bought every single month for the last 36 months, basically. And it, I'll just can keep continuing to buy that because it's very much a stock or an ETF for the future, basically. Right. Um, I have in terms of like different sectors, I have probably say 15 percent is in um, oil, oil and gas. You've got. And I'm looking to sort of reduce that. Basically, I'm I'm more focused towards future technologies. Um, I'd say again, probably about fifteen percent in insurance, ten percent in financial, so um, like banks, etc., that kind of thing. Um, I'm trying to think what else there is. So I also have my own uh, clean energy stocks that I invest in. Also in the UK, we have one called Greenco Wind. Bluefield Solar Income Fund and uh, the Renewable Investment uh, Investment Group. So, and they're all, all about in investing mainly in the UK, but sort of in our Western Europe in um, you know, green green energy, basically. So um, that's something I'm quite bullish on in the long run. Um, they pay a nice dividend between four and six percent. They um, I know, I know for Green Coat Wind, they are growing their dividend based upon inflation. So, okay, when they get a better year, they might sort of be, try and beat inflation, but even at 10% at the moment, that's a nice dividend yield to, to have and to know that's also relative to inflation is nice. Um, so that's definitely a sector I'm trying to grow, just so I see that as a something for the future. I'm going to circle back to the renewable energy here in a second, but you did mention yeah. banks, and I'm guessing yeah. um, in the UK that would be like Lloyd's of London and exactly. Lloyd's. Lloyd's is my biggest holding bank-wise. Um, again, they pay about a 5% dividend, which is quite nice. The only thing is with banks in the UK, again, the dividends aren't as reliable, um, and also the performance is sort of very reliant on how the economy does, basically. Okay. So, but they just... Again, that's sort of somewhat something that everyone sort of holds in their portfolio, a, a small percentage, basically. In Lloyd's and in Barclays or no? Um, I looked at Barclays. Lloyd's was just at a better sort of price to earning ratio and the, the valuation was just slightly better. So that's the reason I um, swung towards Lloyd's, basically. Um, and you mentioned, <laughs> and I find this mind boggling, you mentioned that the banks, their dividends aren't, I think you use the word stable. They're not, 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 not reliable in terms of, reliable. you know, if, if they suddenly had a bad year, they you know, they could quite easily cut their dividend quite significantly. So, um, I mean, quote me if I'm wrong, but I think Barclays had some payment a couple of years ago where they had to, um, I don't know, I think it was something overseas or something like that, where they got a lawsuit against them or something like that. And they had a large, um, fine to pay basically. And it meant that obviously, the profits of the uh, dividends paid from the profits, their profits were reduced. That meant their dividend was cut, stuff like that. They're very susceptible to um, those sort of things and, you know, changes by the government also that could suddenly affect how much profit they make, whereas other sort of individual companies are sort of, um, you know, less uh, affected by, also, you know, changes by sort of the government, etc. Right. Now, so, the reason I 
find that a little bit mind-boggling and no i i can't correct you because i i don't really know the history of barclays or lloyd's for that matter yeah yeah but the history of the canadian banks people have probably you've probably heard heard or saw me retweeting mm -hmm. the settling nomads tweet or heard on my other episodes yeah. that canadian banks have been paying dividends for over 150 to nearly 200 years yeah which is mind-boggling because like uh, I believe it's Bank of Nova Scotia, maybe Bank of Montreal that started paying a dividend in 1829. Nice. And a quick trivia question for you. Do, do you know what year Canada became a country? Uh, I don't. That's, I'm, I'm pretty much silly here now. I'm going to say 1860. Close, 1867. Oh. So, yeah, you weren't too yeah. far off. But, yeah, just the fact that... Uh, Many of these banks in Canada have been paying dividends for, mm -hmm. you know, decades yeah. longer than Canada has even been a country is just yeah. mind boggling to me and the longevity yeah. and the consistency. Now, again, of course, I, over the course of 150 to 200 years, there may have, there probably were a dividend cut somewhere along there as well, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 But that, again, that's still, you know, that's a great, um, place to start also for investors you know just hearing that okay you obviously do your own research but the fact oh this company's been paying dividends for nearly 200 years now that company's going to continue to pay dividends because at the end of the day we as dividend, we as dividend investors love the dividend but the business obviously uses that to keep the you know its investors happy right. without right. investors being happy they'll just sell the stock and the bit the business goes you know backwards basically so it works both ways, doesn't it? And um, yeah, I had heard a lot about how um, sort of, I guess, attractive um, Canadian banks are in terms of dividends and how reliable they are in terms of paying those as well. Exactly. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something I'd heard of, but I didn't realize it had almost been it's almost two hundred years. Yeah, I think I have to look it up again. I think it's Bank of Montreal that in uh, started in eighteen twenty nine. So in six years, in, in twenty twenty nine, yeah. they'll be celebrating the the two hundred year anniversary. Years. Yeah, and then the next one, which I think is Bank of Nova Scotia in eighteen thirty three. Okay. Um. Yeah. So. You know, so ten years from now they'll be at at the two hundred yeah. anniversary mark. Um, which is very impressive. Yeah, extremely. Uh, circling mm -hmm. back to you were talking about the renewable energies, solar, yes. wind. Um, yeah. And these are definitely, it's great if you have uh, dividend paying companies in this, but that's also definitely part of a, I would think a growth portfolio and especially at your mm -hmm. age at 24, yeah. you're looking at, okay, over the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years, yeah. you know, like, the writing's on the wall. We have to transition to green energy, right? You know, yeah. I'm also still kind of bullish on oil, and you are as well. You own BP and Shell, yeah, or yeah, I think yeah. you said Shell. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we know oil's not going away, but I think it's just the reduction in oil over the next thirty to forty years yeah. and the the increase the increasing use mm -hmm. of of the renewables. So are you? Yeah. Uh, I I see you nodding your head. So you, you know you're definitely looking at these as both that solid dividend player payer. Mm -hmm plus the the growth aspect of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, for me, it's sort of, they're just sort of 30 or 40 years ahead of where these, you know, the oil giants are. And I think how these oil giants will get there is by acquiring these renewable energy companies because the oil giants are so much bigger than these renewable energy companies that have been around for say 10, 15, 20 years. Right. Their market cap might be somewhere between one and five billion whereas you know you've obviously got um the likes of bp and shell etc and um exxon they you know where they're you know upwards of 100 billion and can just swallow those sort of companies up without it really going noticed that's where how i see the likes of these oil majors getting to you know the targets they need to be and how because these companies obviously innovating all the time the um renewable energy companies, whereas you've still got the likes of BP, Shell, I know, I don't know about Exxon Mobile, but I'm sure by Exxon, I don't know, I'm sure they are, but they're still investing heavily also in oil, because you still, a lot of vehicles, et cetera, are still gonna rely on oil for the next 20 years. Um, so it'd be stupid to stop investing in that, but that's obviously causing also a lot of um, social unrest with a lot of groups, et cetera, especially in the UK, I don't know how much it is 
in sort of you know North America, but we have a lot of um, protests, etc., about how these companies are wrongly investing their profits into more oil and that kind of thing when it should be put into you know investing in renewable energy and lowering bills, etc., on energy also. Right. Yeah, I, I, we do see a similar thing here in North America with you know the larger oil companies, the Exxon's and yeah. the Imperial Oils that. Yeah. They're doing a little bit of their own R&D and investment on the renewables, but mm. at the same time, they're yeah. just big enough to, like you said, the, these smaller uh, smaller cap companies that have been around maybe 15 years, like they yeah. can just swallow them up and say, oh, thank you very much. Now we can, you know, yeah. there might be a little bit of greenwashing in there too. You know, they swallow oh, up a, a, some renewable energy company and say, look, well, look at what we're we're doing to, you know, uh, reduce our yeah. carbon footprint, <laughs> but mm-hmm. you're still pumping out how many millions of barrels exactly. of oil per day? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's. I, I agree with that. There's definitely it, it, for them. It's just saying, oh look, we're doing our part, but then they are still investing just as much, if not more, into new or you know oil um, sectors and new areas to find new oil. So yeah, yeah but I do see them acquiring those sort of renewable energy companies going forward i think that's the way they'll go in the next 10 years to allow them to almost cheat their way to getting to the targets they need to hit yeah um yeah i agree with you so uh, let's move on any other sectors that uh make up your portfolio i'm trying to think what else any reits any uh telecoms any yes i do have a reit actually that's a good point um that's a British one called 24 Select. So that's a monthly um, a monthly dividend. And I wanted to, I, I think, get that just to, one, make sure it is a, obviously, do, do my research and make sure that it's not just going to be a monthly dividend, but the company's not got any profit in it, but also get a monthly income that I can see that's compounding every month. Yeah. So with my brokerage account, I have to get, for the dividend to invest, reinvest itself, I need it needs to be a ten pound dividend or more. So that meant obviously throughout the year, making sure that, that company pays me one hundred and twenty pounds or more because it pays out twelve times. Um, so I managed to get to that stage and that um, thing, and now it does reinvest every year, and it's really good to see that compound because I think at the start of the year I was getting paid ten pound thirty per month in each for that dividend but now it's at about 10 pound 54 okay it's only 24p a month yeah but that you know every snowflake adds into that, that snowball right exactly you know that might be 12 pounds um and that's without me adding any more money to it that's just it growing naturally um and that's why i love i do love reads i actually um my daytime job is a property investor so Obviously, with that, you get the monthly rental, et cetera, and it's nice to see that, but there's obviously other um, work involved in terms of earning that monthly income, right. and you can pay taxes and all that kind of thing on that as well, so it's it's different, but that's why I like to read the fact that you've got that um, you know, monthly payment, basically, um, a nice passive monthly payment that's constantly growing as well, and that's what you don't get in property. Unless you up your rent, you're not going to get more more profit each month so um just curious is 24 select uh like do they own re- retail real estate industrial office space uh, it's real estate yeah sorry it's um it's a residential real residential estate, real basically. estate. so yeah. like yeah. apartment buildings and those types of properties. yeah exactly and you know large development blocks etc that's where most of their um you know investment is based so I- i'm just going to add my two cents here the majority yeah. of my viewers and listeners know that I love my REITs. I have several uh, Canadian REITs. They are all monthly dividend payers and, you know, very similar to you. Just really, really enjoy seeing that uh, uh, that payment, that dividend show up into my brokerage account on, uh, say, the 16th of every month or some of them are early mm-hmm. and some are, are later each month. Yeah. But the majority, the majority of them pay out on the 15th of the month and then it's settled into my brokerage account on the 16th so it's like the 16th of every month is like my favorite day every month so (laughs) yeah a couple of days from now then yeah Yeah. exactly yeah tuesday i'm just looking forward to it um yeah my 
uh, the app I use on my phone, it doesn't have um, automatic drip. So okay. I just still manually reinvest everything, which yeah. I kind of like because then I can say, okay, well, I'm going to take the, the $20 or the $40 from that dividend and put it towards, you know, X, Y, or Z or one, two, three, or exactly. whatever. You might, find that, you might find that a stock's dipped or something in the last month and you want to you take advantage of that. And, and that, I do like that also because mine does reinvest automatically. Um, but it's a case of I, I know there's other stocks out there that actually I might say sometimes don't reinvest automatically because I want to put my money in another stock. Yeah. So as I said, like this, the real estate, a real or a house builder paid out for me um, on Friday. Um, I will reinvest in that company, but I think the dividend going forward, and it's why I'm not investing in that company anymore at the moment is looking maybe as though it might not grow next year. They've grown it this year, but the, the way the housing market is, I don't know how it is in um, sort of North America, but we're seeing a growth in terms of house price. Um, it's sort of very stagnant and um, mortgage rates have gone up quite a bit over this side of because of inflation. Um, and it means that less people are buying houses, basically. So obviously when less people are buying houses, the house builders don't make much money. The dividend is at risk, basically. So I'm deciding not to invest any more money in that company at the moment until the housing market sorts itself out. And then you've got cash machine, those sorts of businesses, because you got, you know, in the UK, it's very different. We've got very limited land supply and the house companies can sort of charge what they want for new builds because they're in demand. We've got, we need 300,000 houses being built a year. There's only about 200,000. That creates a massive demand and very little supply. The house prices just go up basically. So right. Um, they're good companies to invest in in the long run, but they're not so consistent with a dividend because sometimes, like 2008, obviously we had a housing market crash in the UK. We're sort of potentially heading that way. We might avoid it, but it's you know it could be it could go that way if if the government doesn't sort itself out. Yeah. So again, I'll just let you know a little bit about Canadian real estate. Mm. Um, location 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 like you can get some very inexpensive real estate if you're willing to live in you know the, the far north part of saskatchewan yeah but if you want to live in vancouver or toronto it's expensive it's like yeah. Yeah, yeah west vancouver has to be some of the most expensive real estate in well definitely in canada if not the entire world like it's yeah it's similar so west so we in central london the you know house prices are ridiculous you know you're probably looking at the average house price in some streets is probably you know 10 20 30 million pounds but yeah. but you just have a lot of foreign investment coming there london is just an attractive place to live as you know as well as vancouver but it's just a case of people want to own real estate there to say they've got it but i completely understand what you're saying we have areas as well in the uk where a lot of people who i know invest in their properties up north of the uk okay obviously uk is tiny compared to what you think of canada being but it's all on a relative scale. We have areas up north where you might get a house for fifty thousand pounds, but in London that house is probably worth a million pounds. Um, but it's all to do with location and access to jobs and where the money is, because we have a very centralised. Um, I guess funding is very centralised towards London, you know, infrastructure-wise, and we, are, you know, the major hubs and airports and right. ports, etc., are down in the south. Whereas, you know, there's very little um, investment up north and there's sort of a, a sort of a north-south divide, basically. So just to put that in context, because I'm not yeah. 100% sure, I have seen some YouTube videos of like people driving from the, the southern tip of the UK to the northern tip of uh, is it Scotland at the north. Yeah. So how long of a drive would that be? I think just in terms of miles or kilometers, so it's about probably 1,100 kilometers. Um, and that's, but that's right from one tip to the other. It's called Land's End to Penzance. So that would be... Okay, Land's End to John O'Groats. So 1,100 kilometers, you're looking at maybe a 12-hour drive, give or take? Probably, probably a bit more. I'd say some guy did claim he did it, um, obviously illegally, but he said he'd done it in about eight hours. He basically, uh, he, he raced the car from one end to the other, but really, you're probably looking at 16, 18 hours because... At the very far tips, you've got very rural roads, etc. Um, but realistically, you would just be driving that to say you've done that. If you were to drive from London to the very north of the UK of England, 
you're probably looking at four to five hours okay to so put on a, and that's probably 300 miles maybe at most so just to put this in context i'm in ontario i'm in um yeah. sort of on the border between central and eastern ontario where i am it's called the bay of Kenya okay. region if i were to start yeah. driving west and i drove west for 24 hours i would still yeah. be in ontario right okay <laughs> so <laughs> yeah I, if you drove west from where i live in the sort of southeast of the uk if i drove west for five hours i'd probably only, i'd probably at the very edge of wales so almost about to drop into the sea and if i drove east for half an hour i'll be dropping in the sea so that's you know it's probably it's five hours from one side of the country right or into another country one side of the sort of great britain to the other yeah so Not just getting back to the real estate and i, I yeah. we kind of got off the reads and sort of talking about physical real estate and obviously yeah, yeah. it's just massive amounts of land in canada a lot of obviously mm -hmm. a lot of northern canada is you know arctic tundra that's more or less unusable yeah yeah um, not suitable for resident land so property yeah you know the, the physical real estate in canada can get extremely expensive in, in the major cities and that's obviously mm -hmm. like anywhere in the world i'm sure new york and los angeles and chicago isn't cheap real estate either miami um yeah or even oh, australia yeah, yeah, yeah. sydney's probably expensive too i is you know attractive places to live and just to sort of you know if you're wealthy you just go oh i, I own one in miami i own one in new york one in london one in sydney or whatever right. you know it's just and one, in one of those things isn't it? it's, just, it's competition with other rich people when you get to that sort of stage but yeah they're attractive places to live they've got a lot of opportunities and that kind of thing and that's why you know it draws a lot of people there uh moving on from real estate any last uh sectors probably getting down to sort of the the things that are sort of that maybe like one percent in your portfolio or something you just don't really yeah, think I'm about too often think, yeah. pharmaceuticals um so there's a couple of companies that are um i believe they're uk based you've got astrazeneca which is a very big pharmaceutical in the uk and then you've got a company called glaxo smith klein gsk which i know some american investors that i follow do invest in them they're sort of quite very profitable companies um because they they sort of own a large share of the market um so that they are they're able to make good profits and pay a nice steady dividend basically so they're they're nice companies to invest in. You know, the especially with COVID, they made loads of money during COVID because obviously you've got, you know, all the jabs, et cetera, and vaccines that are provided. And I think that's where they've also become popular. In fact, people a lot of people have probably invested on the off the back of COVID. Right. That's not to say they're going to make as much money as they did during that time, but you know, there's always things out there that they're looking to invest in. And also, you know, with more and more people um populating the earth and you've got more and more diseases etc and more things to cure that kind of thing they're always going to be a company that's you know in demand basically um so that's a company that sort of sector i'm i'd say i'm looking to grow because they do have you know fairly solid dividends even at three or four percent they grow the dividends quite nicely um so that area that's definitely an area where i'm looking to sort of maybe increase that <laughs> interesting yeah so yeah, definitely. As soon as you said AstraZeneca, that's the first thing you think of is COVID and vaccine jobs, right? Yeah. Like, and yeah. obviously a lot of those companies, uh, or a few of them, you know, Johnson and Johnson and a few of the other companies that made the vaccines, yeah. you know, just, you know, profited from other people's misery, unfortunately. Well, I mean, yeah. that's the way the yeah, world yeah, works, yeah. I guess, but... Mm -hmm. Before we sign off, because I see we're already well up over 50 minutes and we're going to be pushing an hour here real soon. Um, sort of any last thoughts, um, anything you would like to shout out, anything that you would like to say to maybe new investors or other people your age or? I think it's something that I, something I said the other day was of all the people I sort of hear on, you know, the Twitter family, et cetera, no one has ever regretted it starting investing when they did. So it's all, you know, people say when's the best time to invest and it's always now, not tomorrow or, or yesterday. You know, it's yeah. as soon as you can get that snowball started because you will never, ever regret when you began investing. And the more you understand it, the, the more you'll become addicted like I am now, basically. 
just get that get that started and you'll uh, reward yourself later down the line when you you know you have a choice whether you want to work or not yeah i, I couldn't agree more um i i've actually heard it said what's the best time to invest well 20 years ago what's the second best time to invest today right so yeah exactly that awesome well Thank you so much for coming on and spending time with yeah, me here on the Passive Income involved. Podcast. Uh, I've truly appreciated and enjoyed our conversation. Thank you again for explaining legal in yeah. general to all of us here in North America. <laughs> That's <laughs> very appreciated because, like I said, we see it all the time and we didn't know, well, yeah. I didn't know what it was. And I bet a lot of other yeah. people yeah, in Canada don't know either. L G E N as well for anyone who doesn't, yeah, but you might just see L G N. Right. The That's the full symbol for legal in general. Awesome. So, uh, yeah. Last word. Thank you very much for the oh yeah, you're very welcome. Very welcome, and definitely would love to have you back uh, sometime in the future. Yeah, and you know we'll check in down the road, see how exactly. see how your dividend journey is going, <laughs> see how your addiction is yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, when I start, you know, when uh, now my property business is starting up, you know, my I just plan on getting that snowball moving even quicker, basically. I'm, I'm at the stage now where I want to be starting to pay off my more, um, my larger out monthly outgoings, start getting that covered by dividends is the plan, and then that will keep increasing. Um, so yeah, no. so I, hopefully you'll see my journey on um, on Twitter. If you follow me, Dividend Addict, at Eamon BF. And um, yeah, Dividend Dave also creates some... Uh, but, you know, great content out there. So, uh, yeah, it's been great having um, been able to chat with you today. And, um, yeah, look forward to hopefully doing this again sometime soon. Yeah, definitely. We'll we'll check in in six, eight, 12 months, and we'll see how, yeah. how things are going with you. And, um, again, thank you so much for coming on. And if you're still here, still watching, nearly an hour later, subscribe. Yeah.